Most of the things in cybersecurity have been the same things that have been plaguing the industry for years, and we just don't fix them. I think that if you picked an industry that has blinky light or shiny object syndrome, it would be cybersecurity. The startup investment landscape is changing, and world-class companies are being built outside of Silicon Valley. We find them, talk with them, and discuss the upside of investing in them. Welcome to Upside. Hello, 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 and welcome to the Upside Podcast, the first podcast finding upside outside of Silicon Valley. I'm Eric Hornung, and I'm accompanied by my co-host, Mr. Well-Connected Introvert himself, Jay Klaus. Jay, how's it going, man? Is that a compliment? It's not an insult. (laughs) I I just think it's mind-blowing. You have, I I don't know how many LinkedIn connections you have, but I have to guess that it's over, you know, 2,000. You got tons of Twitter followers. You know a ton of people. You're incredibly well-networked. But here you are. You We're here at South by Southwest. We've been in CES together. And networking drains you. Yeah. Yeah. Exhausted. Yeah. This is a common misconception about the man, the myth, the legend, Jay Klaus. Did you just call yourself the man, the myth, the legend? I did. That's embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> common misconception about myself is that most people assume I'm an extrovert. And I'm very much not. And being in such people intensive environments, especially with a lot of strangers where there's not like a clear goal or thing that I'm doing. It's just like meeting people for meeting people's sake. So hard for me. Can you be one of those guys who is just like, if I just get a little tipsy, then I can get really into this or or it doesn't matter how drunk you are. This is just not going to be your thing. No, I mean, I do it and I do it and I think I do it fairly well, especially if it's not multiple of these things in one day, but I do it pretty well. I would say that a social lubricant helps a little bit, but at the end of the day, it's not, it doesn't like get me into it per se. It just makes me a little bit more comfortable. So how are you going to detox from 10 days of South by Southwest, which has literally just been nonstop meeting strangers? Yeah. I detox by finding time to be alone and like really leaning into it. Like I will probably hole up in my apartment like get under the covers and watch like the rest of that 2000s documentary series in silence with my phone, like turned upside down for. I'm sure your girlfriend loves that answer. (laughs) So this is the one thing I really love about my girlfriend is it doesn't feel like I am, you know, pulling from the being around people bucket when I'm around her. So it sounds weird to say, I feel like I'm alone when I'm around here. That's not what I'm saying, but I, I don't have the energy drain that I do around other people when I'm around. So romantic. I feel like I'm alone when I'm with you. No, see, that's what I'm saying. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. I feel very seen and, and appreciated. And yeah, she refills the bucket, refills the cup. Refills the bucket. That is, so that's a phrase, right? I don't think so. I think it is. Like, refills the cup, at least I can like play with. I can, I get a plate off of. You know, there's, there's a reason I was single for five years, Eric. True, but you're not single in the sense of being in a room with people today, you're here with me and we are talking to who, Jay? Today we are talking to Marcus Carey, the founder and CEO of ThreatCare. ThreatCare allows organizations to better defend against cybersecurity threats by improving vulnerability management and defense capabilities. Their platform is a breach and attack simulation technology that allows security teams, incident responders, and network forensic practitioners to reduce their attack surface by continuously monitoring their cybersecurity posture. Marcus, something that I did find out, has a background as a Navy cryptologist. Mm, That's a title that not everybody has. That is not a common title by any means. And I'm excited to dig into that because that sounds like a whole can of worms. Mostly I'm just interested in how people get into that. I think that this whole space is something we've been talking about a lot and wanting to have somebody from a cyber background on because I think everyone just uses this term cybersecurity. And it could mean so many things. Everybody wants it. Like, yeah, I want cybersecurity. Yeah, I want to be secure in a cyber fashion. And I also have no idea if and when I am. Like, if someone, I I have such shallow understandings of cybersecurity that if someone was like, yep, I'll make you cybersecure, and they sold me something, I'd be like, I must be set. But really, I could still have tons of vulnerabilities. Who knows? Right. So if you guys were looking for a great interview asking really deep questions about cybersecurity, this isn't it. (laughs) (laughs) But we're going to (laughs) try. 
Um, some more context on Threat Care. They were founded in 2014. They're based in Austin, Texas. They recently raised a $1.4 million seed round from Moonshots Capital, Flyover Capital, and Firebrand Ventures. And our friend John Fine was the one who introduced us. That's right. We put out the call. We said, we're going to go to South by Southwest. We want to meet some Texas startups. John saw a tweet. He said, let me connect you and really got us plugged in here. Talking to other companies, getting us the room here at Threat Care. We're coming to you from the Threat Care conference room. And so appreciate our friends over at Firebrand for that. Let's bring in Scott Gano, an attorney at Taft, Statinius, and Hollister, to teach us about data privacy and security. Taft is a full-service law firm known for assisting entrepreneurs across the heartland. As a reminder, the following remarks by Taft attorneys are for informational purposes only and are not legal advice. This information is not intended to create, and receipt of it does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. No person or organization should act upon this information without first seeking professional counsel. Scott, thanks for coming on the show. How are things going in Dayton? Absolutely great. Spring has sprung in the heartland, so things are looking up. We're happy. Mm, Gotta love allergy season. Indeed. Scott, I want to throw a hypothetical out there for you. Let's say I'm a founder and I have limited resources. What are the three biggest pieces of low-hanging fruit for data security and privacy? So these are the basics. Number one, you have to classify your data. You have to give it a name. You can't possibly govern and protect information if you don't know what it is. And so you have to think of it both in external terms, for example, how the law recognizes such information like PHI for HIPAA, or maybe PCI for credit card data, but you also have to classify it for internal terms so your employees understand the different sensitivities and responsibilities attached to such data. So maybe you call it confidential, proprietary, public, or maybe high, medium, or low priority to help employees understand what data is special and what data is a little less risky. Once you've classified your data, you have to locate your data or map it. You have to understand where it is because you can't possibly tell me it's secure or being used appropriately if you don't know where it is being used. And that's internally, in your offices, technically and physically, both on servers and file cabinets. But you also have to think about the third parties with which you share that information. And then lastly, you have to implement risk based administrative, technical, and physical safeguards to ensure information is protected to the highest level possible. That was great, Scott. Thank you so much. If people want to learn more about Taft or the work that you do, where should they go? Go to taftlaw.com where we have everything about our privacy and data security practice. You can also find me on LinkedIn. Marcus, welcome to the show. Although you should be saying welcome to us since we're using your space here. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I appreciate that. And thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, thanks for letting us use the conference room here at Threat Care for the last two days. We definitely will lay off all of our really hard questions. How about that? I Pre- appreciate, <laughs> appreciate that very much. Thank you very much. On Upside, we like to start with the background of the founders. So can you tell us about the history of Marcus? So how, how in-depth do you want to go? Wherever you want to take us. Whatever seems relevant. Okay, cool. So uh, I'm actually from originally from about 90 miles north of here in a small town called Marlin, Texas. So Marlin is a town of about 3,000 people. So I'm a, I'm a country boy. I tell people when I come into the room, thank God I'm a country boy. It starts playing. <laughs> uh, so I grew up. I was born in my grandmother's house. That's how country I am. Yeah, so I ended up growing up in that small town. I lived in a couple of different cities around Texas, but I was born and raised in Texas overall. When I, became, when I was 18, I joined the military. I did pretty good on my military entrance exam, so... They give you career fields based on how well you do. They they told me that I was going into cryptography, communications, and I didn't know what that meant. But uh, it ended up I ended up work, getting the highest clearance in the land, working pretty much for NSA since I was eighteen. So I did that for about eight and a half years military. Was that test like mathematical? How did they decide this guy is a cryptographer? It's a bunch of different things, and they, the military just gets it right because they end up having the same kind of personality types. In the same, same space. So it's a bunch of clones of yourself. You're working with a bunch of people just like you. Why'd you pick the military? You're 18, you had could have college, you could have went and worked, you, you decided military. What was the thought process there? Well, so uh, believe this or not, I thought I was going to go to the NBA. I was a hardcore basketball player. <laughs> 
I actually had a college offer, but the college offer wasn't full time. It wasn't a full ride. Basically, they would take care of my tuition, but they wouldn't do books or room and board and all that. So I would have to find a way to, you know, come with the rest of the money. And I was from a very poor background. I was seriously the, like the poorest person I knew growing up. So there was no way for me to pay for even part of college. I would have had to have a full ride. So I was too short and too slow to get a full ride to D1. Anywho, ended up, that's why I chose the military, because the military had uh, this thing back then called the Montgomery GI Bill. And that GI Bill, they bill it as it'll, it can pay for college. And so uh, I've always been a nerd my whole life. I knew I was a nerd. I knew I wanted to work with computers. And the military offered me the opportunity to learn computers at 18. Pretty much they give you a trade. They paid for college. And so what my goal was to, funny enough, I wanted to do four years in the military and come back to Austin, Texas, and go to UT. That was the big game plan. I ended up spending eight and a half years in. I did earn my bachelor's degree in the military uh, while I was in the eight, year, eight and a half years. And then I did a master's degree when I got out. So it was all about education. And that was the only way I could have paid for my education is by going to the military. Why was education so important to you? So I grew up in an era where I was born in 75. So I'm, I'm 43 now. Funny enough, my birthday is Friday. I'll be 44. Hey. So I grew up in an era where after the civil rights movement, education was, was really, really harped upon. I remember learning about Dr. Martin Luther King in school. I understood that he, he had a doctorate degree. That means he had a lot of education. And so I kind of wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be like a, have a PhD myself. I no longer want a PhD. <laughs> uh, I did a master's degree, which is plenty. They say a, a bachelor's in science, a BS is BS. <laughs> an MS is more. <laughs> and a PhD is piled higher and deeper. Uh. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I won't, I won't be doing a PhD anytime soon. But uh, I, I knew that I understood that, that being, being black, I, I had to get, get an education to get ahead in life and, and to, you know, to get myself out of our, my situation. So that's why education was super important. Was that your parents that instilled that in you? Not at all. <laughs> I, had a, I had a rough childhood. Man. I, I didn't know my father until I was 26. And I met him. I met him. I'm cool with my father now. And my mother wasn't really around. My mother dumped us on other people. My grandmother pretty much raised me. So uh, I got this crazy story. It's going to make a great movie one day. Yeah, so... I was smart. I was always in gifted and talented classes. And the students that I was that I was with, they all were talking about college. And, and I would do, I did this thing called Olympics of the Minds, where it was like a gifted and talented program. I would do UIL competitions for math and science and all that. So I'm just super blessed that I'm smart. And I was always around the right people in their families, you know, a lot of times we're talking about college and stuff. So I just was around the right people because I was a pretty smart kid. You were 18 and 93-ish? That's right, yeah. Why, you said that you knew you wanted to do something with computers. That's like pretty early in like the computer really revolution and movement, right? So how did, what was your first interaction like with a computer? You're a country boy, right? Yeah, yeah. So my first interaction probably was some kind of Atari series thing. I, we got one at a garage sale. This was like after Atari had been dead. You could, you know how you pick up stuff at garage sales. So that was kind of like my first interaction with a computer type system. But I was in gifted and talented always. I was, you know, one of the couple of black kids in there. I got to program basic when I was in like in third grade. And in high school, I took Pascal programming language. So when I was young, I also saw war games. And a lot of people saw war games and, and any kind of tech kind of thing, even like tinkering, MacGyver, the A-Team, Knight Rider. There was always these tech, you know, during that age, everything was like futuristic and everything was about a computer kit. It was artificial intelligence. Everybody wants to be kit now, right? Kit of something, right? So um, we grew up in an age where there was a lot of hype around technology, even though there wasn't access, there was definitely a lot of hype and a lot of science fiction related to it. And so that and just being, like I said, I, I remember we must have had some of the first apples. So it's just timing and just being in, in the right school kind of district or whatever. But most of the people in the town I was in were, 
I mean, I, it was it was a couple of black people in, in, in the town that I'm talking about. It's Mineral Wells, Texas. Shout out to everybody in Mineral Wells if y'all listen. <laughs> but uh, not a lot of black people in that particular city. And they had access to a lot of cool stuff. Being in, in, and that's when I was in Olympic of the Months. I was in all these little creative programs. And that's how I got into a situation where I was around technology. So the game plan was, okay, I'm going to go do my four years in the military and then go to UT. What actually happened? So I got to Scotland. <laughs> so this is funny. So this is like, it was a transition from being in the hood to being in an intelligence community. This is funny. And I, I, I think I like to tell these stories. So like I said, at 18 years old, highest clearance in the land. I had access to all the intel in the land. I could read any kind of intel report. And so back then, there was a big crisis going on. And y'all may remember the Rwanda crisis, where there was a huge genocide issue. So I would call back home, and I would be trying to talk to them about current events. I was like, I would call back home to the hood. And I was like, man, that's messed up what's going on in Rwanda, right? And my friend was like, I don't know who Rwanda is. What? (laughs) So I was like, I'm in a different world now. That was That was hilarious. So, golly, I even lost the question. I had to tell that story. What was the question again? One more time. Question was, what actually happened? Yeah. Yeah. So I get. So I get out. I, so I get get to Scotland. I instantly start. Man, I started learning how to program databases. I started learning network security. That's kind of like the field that I'm in, cybersecurity. And so, being exposed to that technology, and funny enough, my first duty station, I met my wife, and I had a baby in Scotland. My my oldest son. So. Instantly, stuff got real. This is ignorance on my end. Why Scotland? Is that where the intelligence organization is based? Absolutely. So most of the intel people are stationed... Ignorance, like I said. (laughs) No, no, totally, totally. Most of the intel people are stationed overseas where they're doing some form of whatever. And so uh, I was stationed in an area uh, strategic to, you know, doing stuff related to our, at the time, our enemies. And you could use your imaginations to who was our big enemy in 1993. Your wife, is she Scottish? My wife is from Scotland. but She was born in England, so she, technically it's a toss-up. She moved to Scotland when she was young, though. So she's English, but I met her in Scotland. Was that a tough sell to get her to come back to America? Or come oh, to America in the first place? I mean, golly. So, uh, no, no, not really. So me and my wife have been together for 20-something years. It was it was kind of like we totally clicked one of those things, right? They say they have a saying, when you go to Scotland, you either come back drunk or married, <laughs> or both. <laughs> that should be their official tourism slogan. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's the saying. And, and so uh, a lot of people, you know, a lot of military people who get stationed overseas and get married. The tough part is since I had a clearance, they had to do this background investigation. That was my next question. <laughs> but yeah, so that was it was hilarious. But we've been married for a long, long time and we have we have four kids now. Wow. How long were you in the military before you transferred out and did you, did your masters was that part of the military? How did that all kind of work? Like how long were you there? So I was in the military for eight and a half years. While I was in the military, I took advantage of this program called CLEP Test. I want to write a book on this because this is awesome. So I kind of like, you ever heard of CLEP Test where you CLEP out on, it's like an AP test? Yeah, but you could take it in college, right? So it's like 75 bucks. And if I didn't want to take accounting 101, I could just take the test. Bingo. So I took 115 of those credits. Wow. So I just studied any random subject. I I, kind of mapped out my degree for the distribution goes. Like you needed so much math, you needed so much arts and sciences. And then I taught myself all the subjects and I went and took the test. I'm a nerd, I'm bookworm. So you got your master's without really stepping foot in a classroom. Well, yeah, so yeah, I got my bachelor's, yeah, 115 credits, pretty much. I, I didn't enter a classroom for my bachelor's. And then for my master's, I did an online program. Nerd gang, nerds always win. So I totally gamed the college system. That's awesome. I always wanted to do those tests, but in college, my priorities were more aligned with na- na- natural light than studying for club tests. So that's very impressive. He's talking about like the Ohio Lone Star beer and not like yeah. good sunlight coming into the room. Yeah. <laughs> I heard some, I've heard tales about Ohio State. <laughs> <laughs> so eight and a half years, what happens after that? Help us kind of close the gap between here and threat care. Yeah. So basically I got... I was stationed at Fort Meade for the last almost four years of my Navy career. And at Fort Meade, that's where the National Security Agency is. 
And Fort Meade is the last place that they like to send people because they know that you're going to be a hot commodity for the, the civilians and the duty contractors. Because, I mean, if, if you were to look at it, I tell people that my military career, like for, for cybersecurity or security or whatever in general, you're like Jason Bourne. Like if, if, if there was a cyber element where you could be like a, a well-trained machine, it would be the Navy crypto cryptography route. And so when I was at NSA, I got, they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars, at least a hundred thousand dollars, no joke, on my technical education. So at NSA, I would work for three weeks and I would get training for a week. Work for three weeks, get training for two weeks. Work for three weeks. So the whole time I was there, I took the most high-end civilian training. Also, NSA has its own training as well. And so they train you how to do technical stuff and so it is ridiculous, especially for a sponge like me. I got all kind of certifications, and I was worth a lot of money. I was worth three times more than I was earning on my military salary. Yeah. So you'd be crazy if you re-enlist. So got out the military at Fort Bead. I worked uh, for a DOD contractor for some time, doing security and, and internet working and all that. Did some more work up in the D.C. area. And then how I got back to Austin, where we are here, is a company called Rapid7 hired me. Rapid7 is a cybersecurity company. They went public, I think, last year, maybe two years ago. So I worked for that company. I actually built a product for them, contributed to other products there, and conceptualized products for them. So I've been kind of like a product machine. I built two other products for other people. So after writing products for other people and conceptualizing products for other people, I kind of was like, wow, I should do this for myself. <laughs> did you get to take part in the IPO? Like, I did not, know. Okay, so you didn't have equity, you were just an employee. I was an employee for a couple, about almost two years, then I was gone. Funny enough, my son works for them, and, he yeah. got, and he, uh, he's been working for them for five years. Talk to me about the evolution of technology and the things that you're coding in and what type of like arms race goes on in the world of cybersecurity. It kind of seems like it's a whack-a-mole type game. I mean, I, I think a lot of people think think it is a whack-a-mole, but I, I kind of find quite the opposite. Most of the things in cybersecurity have been the same things that have been plaguing the industry for years, and we just don't fix them. I think that if you picked an industry that has blinky light or shiny object syndrome, it would be cybersecurity. One year, people worry about mobile hacking. The next year, they're worried about full disk encryption. The next year, they're worried about this. The next year is AI and machine learning. So I think cybersecurity, every year there's something different that, that the industry focuses on and that doesn't necessarily fix the old problems. So what is what is threat care focused on? So threat care is focused on imitating breaches on networks, essentially pen testing to allow companies to be able to improve what we call their security maturity capabilities. Basically, we're almost like a retro company where we say, you need to fix all this stuff. You need to get this basic block, blocking and tackling done. And sometimes that, that means buying other security solutions where we'll, we'll recommend other things for them. But the key that we do is we try to automate the whole process. In the past, you would need somebody like a crazy guy like me on your team to figure out all these security problems. And so essentially what we're doing with our system is we're imitating me on your network and giving you recommendations that I would give you to fix it. What's that called, like black hatting? So yeah, so there's a concept called black hat and white hat. The black hats are the bad guys, and so the white hat's supposed to be the good guy. So I, I'm a white hat hacker, that's what they say. He just winked. I don't know what that means. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of people say there's no such thing as a white hat hacker. <laughs> so you're like programmatically, I've heard about these competitions that places like Chase or Google have where they're like, hey, come hack us in this competition, and if you do well, we'll pay you a lot of money, and then we'll patch the problem that you could have exploited. And so you're basically democratizing access to that using your software? So what we do is we, we imitate the hacker themselves. And so what you're talking about, there's bounty programs that, a lot, that uh, other people put out on their products or their services. And so what we do is we, instead of them having to learn how to do all the hacking, our software 
does this for them. Does your software learn? Like hackers learn over time, right? Yeah, I would say so. So, I mean, well, hackers learn all the time for sure. And so we do make improvements in our products that maybe imitate different attacks. And we have actually have, we created this thing. You know, JSON is a markup language. JSON is. So we actually have this, this like little way that you can write up your own JSON. It has to be in our format, but you can actually write these little configurations up and we could imitate other newer attacks if somebody wanted to do that. Hmm. What does threat care not do well? So threat care doesn't some some things there's it's it's, it's kind of impossible to uh, to automate. And on those things we we would have to have somebody to to actually so we can't make purchasing decisions with somebody. So I would say that, that that's where you need a human that knows what they're doing. So we can say we got all this stuff out of your network you should probably get a firewall. So we can we can tell you you should get a firewall, but we don't we don't say you should buy this version of firewall or whatever whatever. Every network's different and every company's different. So every company has different needs. So one of the things that that we do as well is we we actually have light services to kind of help make the right purchasing decision and 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 all that stuff. The networks are so complicated that it, it, it'd be hard to do that in an automated fashion. But we're trying, though. And that's something that in the future that ML could be applied to and stuff. Who is the sort of wheelhouse customer for threat care? Yeah, so the wheelhouse customer for us is are software companies because software companies always need to prove that they're compliant for something. So say if you're a software company that does banking, where you're probably going to have to get SOC compliance or some other kind of compliance like that. Or if you're you're purchasing, I mean, if you're processing credit cards, you're gonna to have to be able to do PCI certification. So we figured this out. This was kind of like the 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 hard thing to figure out for most most people is like we see that there's all kind of reasons like that these people should want to be secure, but unless there's a requirement, they they're not going to be secure. So it ends up being like people like hospitals that you think that they should be secure. Well, there's no really requirement for a hospital to be secure. There's privacy requirements that people kind of confuse with security, like HIPAA, but uh, there's no need for your actual hospital to be secure, and that's kind of scary. What's the difference between privacy and security? So they, they can be combined for sure, but privacy is more of preventing the unauthorized disclosure of, of your information, your personal information. So it's dealing with humans. So we call it PII, personally identifiable information. So I would say privacy is could be a subset to security, but they're different. They're different things. Security, and this is kind of nuanced. Security is make, making sure nobody has unauthorized access to anything. So security is a bigger is a bigger thing. So somebody can't log onto your Mac right there without your permission. And privacy would be like people can't see your browsing history or your credit card information. So it's a little bit nuanced, but for instance, like most, if you, if you like most of these, your medical records, your medical records aren't necessarily going to be, sometimes there's going to be paper and you can go get your medical record. So you need to protect the privacy of your medical record no matter what. And so cybersecurity has morphed from all kinds of different things. And so a lot of people say information security before it's, it was information, it was data security. And so it's it's all the same thing. So if, basically, if it's processed on a machine, that's kind of like computer privacy or whatever. Yeah, but HIPAA covers all every kind of privacy. I mean, whether it's on a record, whether it's a prescription, whatever it's whatever. So they must maintain the privacy. But there's not really a security standard right there. So you work with software companies. Do these typically tend to be like? Fortune 500 level running security simulations, or are you doing like the small, medium sized business that typically wouldn't be able to do like a bounty program? Yeah, so we have customers all over the, all over the place. We have four publicly traded companies that are customers of ours. They're pretty big, pretty big logos. So it all depends on if there is a requirement. Like I said, some some big people that you think would have a requirement don't have any requirement. A major medical uh, place that we know, a big big hospital system. We're spending like one point five million dollars on our cybersecurity. If you go down to another state, there's a hospital we know that's spending ten million dollars a year on cybersecurity. 
but there's one hospital got breached big time, and so they spent a lot of money on cybersecurity. So it, it totally depends when it comes to the size of the company and how much they're actually spending on cybersecurity. There are small companies that spend more than some big companies on cyber. Internally, how do you segment your customers? Do you bucket them at all, or is it just, here's medicine, here's finance? Like, how do you kind of think about customer segmentation? We don't. So I mean, so, so right now, like with any small company, we focus on software companies, and then there's everybody else. So there's people that we, we help out that, that aren't software companies per se. We have an international trade company that we, we help out. They have a website and all that stuff, but they, they deal physical goods. So we have customers that, that don't fit the scope. But uh, I think that, that what we're, we're focused on is every, cust- every small company needs to have some kind of beachhead. And there's books on this stuff, and I'm using terms out of books, and y'all probably know the book. But basically, who do you focus on as a small company, and how do you just totally kill that sector? And and so we focus mostly on our outbound, on reaching those those companies that are software companies that have to prove that they're secure. So that's what we tell people. We help you prove that you're secure for compliance, for regulatory. Sometimes customers ask for, are you, you know, and we, we can provide customers with that. How often do you find companies that, should be proving something and they're just not like how big is the gap between companies that you would I mean are there people that are just not at all living up to the actual law of what they have to prove that are operating we see that a lot in any security company would tell you the exact same thing that there's a lot of people that that, that don't have any kind of real discernible cybersecurity program at all and they are in breach of the law and not having that well they're definitely <laughs> there definitely are regulatory related stuff. There's not like a really law law in the books about cybersecurity. Like you know, there's not a lot of laws. But yeah, so people are definitely in violation of whatever they should be compliant. Yeah, put it like that. How is this different than a security audit? So it is an automated security audit. I would say that it is a security audit, but except we automate it. So what's cool about what we do. Is that some of our customers are, are, I think they used to call them big four, but there's there's these big firms that they go around and audit everybody. Mm-hmm. They use our stuff now. We have three of them that use our stuff. Three of the big four use this product? Yeah. That's a lot of... <laughs> how, do you li- how do you license that? Well, we do it by the team. So if you want to put a copy on your machine or your machine, that, that would be two licenses, and you, you would buy two separate licenses. How much do you pay for a license? It's two thousand dollars per install. Install two thousand dollars per install, and then and that's good for f- all the updates in the future. One year, one year, so it's annual. One year, one C license. Got it. You guys were founded in twenty fourteen, right. right? Talk to me about the journey to get to today. Like, what what did those years between twenty fourteen and twenty nineteen look like? What's what's growth been like? So I mean, it's definitely a lot of learning. So I'm a technical founder, very technical. So uh, in the beginning, I I did everything myself. I wrote front end, back end, all that stuff. Tried to hire some early salespeople. Come to find out that I'm kind of like the best salesperson. So and we're still trying to work to to like understanding. Well, I can I'm technical, but I can actually sell. And a lot of people say that the founder is the best salesperson anyway. It's just trying to grow and and have processes. I don't have a business background or anything like that. You know, just a lot of a lot of reading, a lot of mentoring, a lot of just all the things that you need to kind of understand business. And so now, I mean, I feel like it's been four years. I feel like I got a PhD in business and you know, financing, raising capital, all these different things. You said you weren't going to get a PhD. I feel like it. (laughs) I feel like it. So this is this is what a PhD would feel like, except I don't have to write some kind of long paper. (laughs) You wrote a book. Yeah, I had a lot of help on that, too. <laughs> when you look at your business today, what are the KPIs or what would be on your dashboard of, all right, how healthy is the business? So we actually use a book that is pretty awesome. And if there's any founders out there, I would check this book out. We have this book called Traction by Gino Wickman. And I don't know if a lot of people are familiar with that book. But so that book, we use something similar to KPIs. It's called a it's called a company dashboard. So we definitely on that dashboard, what Gino Wickman does is he he you know basically just like KPIs, there's leading and lagging indicators and all that stuff. So the dashboard is like we 
you know, how many contracts should we be sending out? We, we should be sending out contracts every week. We should be closing a certain amount of deals every week. We should have on that dashboard, we should understand we have stuff like, you know, how many website visits are, are we getting? So we, it's the same concept of KPIs, but we don't use KPIs. But, but those are the kind of things that we're tracking, mostly because we care about sales. It's everything sales related. <laughs> like, cause, cause so many website visits convert and we're trying to convert. So the, the same kind of concept, but it's all about sales. If you could only have one indicator or one stat from your company dashboard to know how good your business is doing, which one would it be besides revenue? Jay loves revenue. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so I would say how many, how many contracts we're actually sending out. That's a really good indicator for us because that means that we got to a point where we're about to close and that's the final stage. It's not the actual close, but we have to send out a number of contracts to get the number of closes. And if you're not sending contracts out, you, that's a big, big red flag for us. What does retention look like for some of the clients that you've had that have had licenses for more than a year? Is everybody renewing? Do you have like an amount of churn? Yeah, we, we have, we, we pretty much have, I think we're at, 80 something percent retention, which is pretty good. Our customers love us and many of them come back for a lot more. Yeah. So how often do you guys add to this simulation? Cause you know, if I, if I'm a customer this year and I run the simulation, you say you got to fix X, Y, Z and I fix X, Y, Z. Is that simulation no longer useful to me? Or is it something where like every time that my product changes, I'm introducing new vulnerabilities that we need to run the same tests on? Well, just like uh, a lot of people that they just worry about writing code. There's this thing called continuous integration where you still need to test all the time, every time you do it to make sure that there are every deployment. Yeah. So there just because your all your security stuff's working now doesn't mean it's gonna be working next month. So our customers and, and our recommendation is that they run our stuff every month. Also another thing that we recommend our customers do and they do is when they're testing out new software. So we just have a customer I was just talking to today. I just came from a customer, and they were trying to buy a SIM. A SIM is a log monitoring system. And so what they did is they used our attacks to generate traffic that should have been caught in the SIM. And they were testing it out, and they were able to tell the people that were in charge of this product or whatever, that, hey, we just did all these simulations, and your SIM didn't see any of it. So before you buy you can run our stuff too. And after you buy, you can make sure it's working over time. Cybersecurity has got to be something that people have been worried about for you know decades, right? So what would you say is the core innovation and in what you guys do that makes you different than what else might be available out there? I think the core, we make everything super simple. <laughs> I'm a big Steve Jobs fan, even though he was crazy. <laughs> I still love you, Steve. <laughs> I'm still quite an Apple fanboy in general. But what Steve Jobs did is he made everything easy. And so our product is super simple to use, but powerful. And I've written a lot of hacking software in my life. I've, I've written software to spy on people, capture their key logs, or whatever kind of... I've wrote some crazy stuff that people use all over the world. I wrote, I wrote software that law enforcement used to catch criminals. So writing all that stuff... It would it require a lot of, you know, if you see a hacker movie, the hackers like typing all this stuff. So fast too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what? What? Instead of knowing, have to know all that those commands and all that stuff, we just make it pretty simple. You just select what you want to do and run it. And we made it so simple that where you can you can have a series of attacks and you can drag and drop in our UI what attacks you want to run, and it'll run those in sequential order. And you can drag and drop the order and hit play, and it runs them in a, a sequential order. So you don't have to know anything about hacking to use our stuff. I tell people we'll take you from zero to hero. What does implementation look like? If I'm a SaaS company, I want to put this in. Is it difficult for me to onboard into this and integrate this into my code base? Well, so how, how it works is you, you install it on a system. So people that are run, doing SaaS, they would in, install it into their environment. And then they would be able to, you, you download what we call, we have a, a threat care app is what we call it. So you, you can install it on Windows, Linux, or Mac. And that system is like a console and it can control other what we call agents. And those agents are just like, you've heard the term botnet. 
So basically, how a hacker can control all these these bots. So those those bots are essentially our agents. So in an organization, you could deploy this in your cloud or on premise, and you can run it all from one machine. That's like your master hacking console is our threat crap. And I I just have to install the app in my environment. There's no actual like deploying into my repo. No, you don't. Yeah, it's, it's separate from your your code. It's not like a, a continuous CI type situation. How does Threat Care evaluate its own security? So we, we do continuous testing internal. We have a security staff, and we also get third party assessments on our on our software as well. So we pay people to hack our stuff. Has anything surprising come out of that? Well, you always you always improving, and there's always bugs and stuff, but we're we're always improving ourselves. So basically the. You know, the whole dog food and thing. And we recommend people get tested so we get tested as well. What types of promises do you make? Like if I use the threat care software and I fix everything it says it needs to be fixed and I still get hacked, does that have any, besides just like trust from the, the customer, does that have any effect on you guys? Well, so here's the deal. Everybody's going to get hacked. And so we're, we're very clear on this. Like, so what our software is meant to do funny enough, is imitate how a hack, how the breach looks on our network, how an attacker moves about their network, so they can actually detect them when it happens. So we're there, essentially, If say if they were trying to break into this office, it's the camera trained to see an intruder, because that's what we're, act, we're acting like, the intruder. So we're not preventing it, we're making sure that if an attacker does come in, that you're seeing the event happen. So if you are breached and have to use our stuff, you should definitely be able to identify that a breach is taking place. That's what we tell our customers. How big is this opportunity? Like, how do you think about the size of the market for threat care specifically, not just the cybersecurity market? We believe it's an enormous opportunity. So people like Gartner says that automated testing is going to be a $20 billion industry in an, by, by uh, 2025. So... Everything, even on the coding side already of people doing software development, you can see that everything's being automated, whether it be with Kubernetes, whether it be with Chef, Puppet, all these different things from a DevOps perspective is, is being done. And so we, we believe that from a security aspect, that's what we do. We're automation, just like those companies, you know, people like Docker and all these other companies have came up and made DevOps super simple. We look to to do security operations in that fashion. So we believe it's a huge opportunity for us to automate a lot of this stuff. Some companies are doing, their, they have their internal red team is what they call it. So we want to be, if you don't have a red team, we'll, we'll be your red team for you. And we can augment any team and, and give them red team capabilities. What is a red team? So red team imitates the bad guys on your network. So you probably heard of a, a popular thing that most developers and most startup people have heard. Have you heard of Chaos Monkey? Yeah. I think you told me about Chaos Monkey. Okay. So it's something that Netflix uses and systems go down and all this stuff. It causes chaos, right? And so essentially you could kind of compare us to that kind of situation where, except we're the security version of that. Hmm. Growing to 20 billion by 2025, that's a very fast growing market. It's moving fast. What's competition look like? Because I feel like there are so many cybersecurity firms. Or maybe there's not. Maybe I just feel like that. Um, yeah, there's tons of people trying to make money in cybersecurity for, for sure. In our space, there's a couple of funded competitors. There's two well-funded competitors in our space that have, have both raised their $20 million. The investors believe that this is a, a, a solid space, and the space is still early, and what's cool about the space is that we actually we actually have our product in more people's hands. We do have a freemium a product. We're, we're averaging about 100 downloads a month on the free product. And uh, that's, that's leading to some conversions on the enterprise side. How does Threat Care differentiate from those competitors you listed? The big way we differentiate is like our software can be installed on any laptop, Windows, Linux, or Mac as a standalone breach and attack platform and our competitors they're mostly web-based they do have agents as well but the fact that you can install our our system that means you can you can run simulations offline meaning that say if you were at a nuclear power plant you can install our stuff and run it on 
in, in that kind of closed network or on a government network or anything of that nature. So some companies have higher security and they don't want to have this cloud thing and, and store their data in the cloud. So that's the big, big differentiator from, from what we do compared to our competitors. How big is your team? So our team is seven people full time and we have a number of contractors that, that work with us as well. And how are they split out? In terms of like, what are they doing? Yeah, so we, we have sales. sales. We have pretty much a really core of each individual role. We have we have sales role. We have a marketing role. We have an engineer role. Two, we have two people working full-time on product. I kind of get my hands in to wherever we need. I do some prototyping. And we have one full-time services person. Uh, we have a security researcher as well. So we, t- we, have, we have really good people for every particular role. And so I kind of compare it to like, if you, you you think of like an atom in a company, like I think we're at like a, a nice little mass and uh, we're ready to explode. So also we talked about that book, Traction. That book, Traction, is excellent on, on trying to, on defining what the, it, it has a, instead of having an org chart, what it talks about in the book is it talks about, it calls it an accountability chart. And so some, some people may be doing different roles, but as soon as you get to a level where you can hire somebody new, you already have the roles and all that stuff laid out. So I highly recommend that book to anybody that's trying to build a company or any investors that are trying to get a good way to operationalize for entrepreneurs and stuff. It's a great way to opt. So if you have a couple competitors in the space that have raised like $20 million, why aren't you guys going out and saying, we're going to raise 30? Well, in venture capital, how things work are, are, are quite interesting, as you all probably know. So many times, uh, these people, the people that, that, that we're, we're going up against, they're funded by some big players in the Silicon Valley, should I say. And, and many times, those, those people, in order to try to get ahead in, in a particular sector, they'll dump money into a couple of companies that, that they have background with whether it be that they were a part of some previous startup that was under that, that uh, portfolio's banner. So that's kind of like, I, that's why we have a couple of people in our space that is popular. And so the concept is pretty hot, and some big-name investors have backed people that they have history with. If you raised $30 million today, what would change about threat care? <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> Uh, we would be on a household E7. <laughs> 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 I'll try to answer it, though. All right. If we were to raise $30 million today, what we would be able to do is we'd definitely be able to expand the team and build on what we've already built. I think we, like I said, we I think we have a solid core, and we, we built upon that. We actually have a, a really good new stuff that we're actually issuing. Uh, we're releasing at the end of this month. That, that does more comprehensive security all around. So what we've done is we, we've, we've got breach and attack simulation down really well. But breach and attack simulation doesn't necessarily build, help build them a program. It helps test the program. And what we found is similar to what I was talking about earlier. A lot of these companies do not have any program whatsoever. And so a $30 million cash injection to our business would actually help us we have this, this mantra that we want to help people build, measure, and maintain their cybersecurity infrastructure. So what we've been doing is we can measure really well, and we can measure repeatedly to help them maintain their program. But the build piece is something that we're releasing to help them build that program. So we'll be able to help anybody, you know, regardless of sector, to help build, measure, and maintain their cybersecurity infrastructure. And $30 million would definitely give, get us, take us a long way down the road on doing that. Would you stay in Austin? Yeah, I think that Austin has the, the talent, and it's, it's, it's cheap compared to, you know, the Bay or what, whatnot. But, uh, yeah, we love Austin, and I think we're an Austin-based company. But $30 million would change a lot of things. Yeah. I don't know. Where, where is, like, the, the hotbed of cybersecurity? Is there a place where that is, like, the industry of, of choice? I don't think there's a hotbed. I mean, Silicon Valley is the hotbed because of the, the money. There's definitely a lot of cybersecurity companies that are, that have came up out of the mid-Atlantic region because of the DOD and all that. Funny enough, I kind of like grew up in that area, me being at NSA and all that stuff. So the mid-Atlantic region is pretty hot for cybersecurity. 
I'm going to take a, a weird right turn here with just a, a couple rapid fire questions because your background is so unique. As a consumer, what are mistakes I'm probably making with my own cybersecurity? So the biggest thing I tell people is to always turn automatic updates on all your devices. And that's the best way to, to survive. I actually use Chrome browser. I recommend Chrome browser because Chrome updates and, and all that stuff. Most of the times you're going to get infected is probably through browsing a bad site and that has some kind of exploit on it. So uh, automatic updates on everything. That includes your home routers, your Apple Watch, whatever device you have, turn automatic updates on. That's the best thing you can do. What about all these like home devices? Should I be worried about having a home device? Yeah, so I, I think that, again, automatic updates uh, on everything. Don't Don't take any chances there. Because these, the so I did some research a while ago, and, and 66% of people never update. Just like anything? Anything. Like home router, all that stuff. And so that's why you hear home routers and stuff like that being part of massive botnets or home devices in general, because nobody updates. Yeah. So, so turn on those updates. If you have a personal website and using WordPress or, or whatever, turn on the updates. Whatever, whatever it is, look for the updates. Also, don't reuse passwords. That's the second best thing you can do. Don't reuse passwords. That's the another big thing. There's several websites you can go to that if there's been any breach of a site you've been to, it's going to have your passwords. And the first thing attackers do is try to reuse that password in multiple sites. They have bots built to do that. So as soon as they get your pass username and password from one site, what they do is they'll run this bot and it'll tell them how many sites they can log on to. That's terrifying. It is. Don't love that. Good thing I use different passwords for everything that I do. No, you don't. <laughs> use one of the password managers, one pass or last pass. The one password or last pass. Use one of those. Uh, how much do you know about aliens? Aliens don't exist. I, I tried to search it while I was at NSA. Seriously. Are you allowed to say that? <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> they, don't, they don't exist. That was the main thing I was searching for. And then say our stuff. If, if 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 aliens existed, Edward Snowden would would have released it. Really? Yeah, why not? He leaked everything else. <laughs> <laughs> Fascinating. Awesome. Well, this has been a lot of fun, Marcus. After the show, if people want to learn more about you or Threat Care, where should they go? Oh, just you go to threatcare.com. You can follow Threat Care on Twitter or any other social media. You can also follow me on Twitter for my witty banter and jokes. Marcus J. Carey on Twitter. All right, Eric, we just spoke with Marcus Carey of Threat Care. Where do you want to start? You want to talk about the founder? You want to talk about the opportunity? Wow, I didn't even put that together until you said that. Marcus Carey of Threat Care. Care Care. How about that? Should have gone with Threat Carey. Oh, that would be a great Twitter handle. Marcus, if you're listening to this, which I imagine you are, consider changing your Twitter handle to Threat Carey. Or a pseudonym- pseudonymous? Is that how you say that? Pseudonymous? Pseudonymous Pseudonym? account. Oh. Isn't that a word? pseudonymous account a pseudonym yeah i guess so a pseudonymous account called threat carry and it's a it's a merger account between threat care and marcus carry and this has gone on too far for me not to get into what i want to talk about first it could be a little bit of an a caricature of you're still like going down this path we're still doing cyber, this the cyber threat his name is threat carry and he looks a little bit like the sim the burglar sim from sim one on pc but in like more 2D animation form. Marcus, we will be taking our check. You can mail that. <laughs> <laughs> no, just kidding. So I think one thing we haven't really done recently on Upside is kind of walk through how we think about a company. We've been doing, we've been walking through a company, but we haven't kind of stepped back and for, we've had a lot of new listeners. So for the new listeners on Upside, we like to answer four questions indirectly. Do you have those four questions? I do. I like this test. How committed is this founder? What are the founder's chances of success in this business and in life? What does winning look like in terms of revenue and my return? Why has this founder chosen this business? What you'll notice about those four questions is that three of those questions are specifically about the founder. So Jay, I think with Threat Care, we should start with the founder. Marcus was one of the most unique stories we've had on to date. And that's saying something because we've had some incredibly unique people on. We have had people on who are nothing like you and I. 
NSA Scotland from a small town in Texas, which I thought he was going to make a joke and say, yeah, just a small town in Texas, something like 300,000 people. But no, it was like really a small town in Texas of like 3,000 people. And to tie all of that experience together and his experience in the private sector and then say, you know what, I want to launch a startup. I don't know. The, the thread just felt there from the beginning of the interview to me. I agree with that. I wouldn't say that I like stories of founders with really tough upbringings, but I certainly appreciate them and think it shows something about them and, and gives them a certain element of their character that we don't see in all other founders. So Marcus, being a basketball player, thought he was going to go and play in the NBA, could not get a full ride to college and therefore couldn't go to college because he couldn't afford room and board. Goes in the military at age 18, is tested into working for the Navy cryptography group, and then eventually the NSA. What a crazy testament to somebody's intelligence to test into that group at age 18. Now, a former company that I worked at, the CEO there also spent time in NSA. His right-hand man, our COO, spent time in the NSA. Sean, the founder, joined the military at age, I believe, 16, like lied to get into the military early and joined the NSA. And so when Marcus shared that fact about his background, I'll be honest, I was a little on edge in the interview because people who are trained in intelligence operations know how to communicate in a different way. <laughs> and it always made me uncomfortable at my former job. There would be times where I'm having a conversation with one of these guys and I can choreograph where this conversation is going to go a little bit to know like, okay, this is a softball. This is a softball. He's about to punch me with a question that he wants me to blurt out an answer to, to give him information. And I didn't know how that would play out where we're playing interviewer, but I did feel like Marcus was being very forthcoming with his answers and giving us a lot of insight into his own background, into the company. And his story is one of the more awesome paths to see. Do you think he bugged the room? I don't know. I don't know. He could have bugged the whole the whole building. Who knows? We were in his spot, you know? Who knows? He wrote the book on cybersecurity. Yeah. One thing I've realized since we added Marcus to our Podco Twitter list, which is all of the guests that have been on the podcast on Twitter, if you want to check it out, you can go to Twitter and go to our profile and we have some public lists. One of them is the list of all of the guests that have been on the podcast. So check that out. Since Marcus has been added to it, I've noticed just how prolific he is in talking about cybersecurity and all of these things that I have no idea what he's saying. But people seem to really dig it because he gets a ton of comments, tons of likes, and a lot of shout outs from people saying, hey, thanks for doing this. Hey, this is really cool. Hey, I just someone just tweeted, I just cracked my first hashed passcode or something, and they were having a conversation about it. So I didn't really understand that, and that's probably my fault on the research heading in until after the interview when I was doing a little bit more digging. And I, I think that Marcus really, really knows his stuff. So here's an interesting point, though, from our lens here on Upside. It's clear why this founder chose this business. He was in it and doing it and trained highly in it, and he saw the problems. He seems very committed. He started a company to do it. He left probably a well-paying job and is certainly foregoing the salary of very high-paying jobs to do this. His background makes sense. Now, as an investor, are you looking at this from the perspective of this background makes a lot of sense or from the perspective of this founder knows how to run a startup company? I'm not saying Marcus doesn't at all. I'm saying that it's clear that his background is perfect. Now let's talk about Marcus and his ability to start and run a company, which is something that is new to him. I think one thing that has to be tough is making strategic decisions from a biz dev perspective, which when you come from government, there's not a lot of, especially NSA, I would assume, there's not a lot of biz dev. And in his last job, I'm guessing he was more on the tech side. He might have even said that. So, Hank, right. please tweet at us at Upside FM if you have something to say. <laughs> he hasn't had a lot of experience, it would be my assumption, in business development, in pricing decisions, in customer negotiations, though he has had you know conversations and negotiations, I'm sure. But all of these things that you learn kind of coming up in the private sector when you have to dabble in a little bit of them here and a little bit of them there, he may have skipped. So then it gets to his team 
And can they execute on that? Or can he become smart enough, quick enough to learn to execute on these things? Some positive signs. 80% retention on customers at Threat Care is investing in knowledge by reading traction. And that's guiding a lot of the way he measures his KPIs and his company's performance. I loved the story about him taking the tests in college and not going to classes. That also is a really good mark for me on his track record. Has seven full-time employees, but we did not get much clarity in the way of total number of customers other than working with several Fortune 500 companies. So I'm, I'm a little lacking on pure numbers and data here for this opportunity. So am I. I feel like I want more on that side. And Marcus's inclinations are definitely more towards the tech side and the learning side and the let's make this product product amazing side, or at least that's what we got from this interview. He alluded to a couple well-funded competitors in the space, which is a bit of a shadow to me, even though it is a $20 billion automated testing industry he's attacking to his own estimation, which falls into our big bucket and it's not going to get less important if several of the big four accounting firms are using the software. To me, that's a very good sign of product market fit and a very good sign that he's on the right path. So I'm asking as an investor, is he going to continue to outrace some of these well-funded competitors? Is his secret sauce saucier than their sauce? And will he be able to capture a significant portion of this market aside from what's already out there? And I'm guessing that in the cybersecurity space, this may not be a one solution and that's it type market. It seems like if I'm really worried about my cybersecurity, I'm probably going to try multiple tools or employ as many measures as I can to make sure that I'm good. So it may not even need to be that he is the one and only automated testing service on the market. So the way I understand the market right now is that there are two ways a CISO, which is a chief information security officer, would look at their security. One, they do it themselves. They do an internal review where they say, okay, here's what we have. Here's all of our tools and strategies. And I think that's what you're referring to with multiple tools there. The second way is that people, that same CISO will go out and hire a third party. That's called a security audit. That security audit firm will likely employ their own set of tools to evaluate that business. I think that threat care fits into both those buckets for that CISO. So whether you're accessing threat care directly by buying the software or you're accessing it indirectly through a security audit, I think that's that's a really interesting path that you could access threat care two ways. I don't know that a CISO would make the conscious decision to choose Threat care and two of its competitors just to cover its bases on its diagnostics, depending on price. I wish you would have defined CISO when we're talking to Marcus, because I'm like over here thinking about seesaws. I'm like seeing this like teeter totter in my mind. I had no idea what a CISO was. And I was like, oh, yes, good. Good point. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you. Chief Information Security Officer makes a lot of sense. Point taken for sure. So, Eric, since we didn't get a lot of numbers and we can't pretend to do any real backwards math here, what are you looking for from Threat Care six to 18 months from now? I want to hear about two things. I want to hear how their pricing plays out. I feel like it's still pretty early in Threat Care's existence, and pricing is going to tell me a lot about how much their customers value the product. It's going to tell me a lot about the feedback they're getting through the big four and other security audit firms about the effectiveness of the product. And pricing is just going to really matter, I think, a lot to the future moat of this business, which is, do I keep it low and grow market share, which is, I'm guessing, what a lot of the people who are, do it, who are well-funded are doing? Or is it, my product is 10x better so I can charge a multiple and just mint cash to grow other sides of this business. The second thing I'm looking for is a little bit of clarity on the business model itself. So I get that they are charging a licensing fee for this product, 
but it just seems like there are so many areas of potential add-ons or areas where they can make very smart data-driven recommendations to CISOs, Jay, look at that, throwing that name out there again, who are maybe not the most sophisticated, but want to do their job well. What about you? So I'm looking at one of Marcus's own proclaimed KPIs, which is contracts closed. I want to see how many customers are using threat care. And also, does that retention continue to be as stellar as that 80% or even higher? I think that's going to be a really, really good mark in users' confidence in this product and the staying power, the stickiness, the efficacy of the product itself. And obviously, more contracts close equals one of my favorite things, Eric, which is revenue. Money, 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 money. Money. <laughs> right on beat, Jay. All right, guys. Sorry for that. If you have thoughts on threat care, we'd love to hear them. You can tweet at us at Upside FM or email us hello at Upside.FM. Otherwise, we'll talk to you next week. That's all for this week. Thanks for listening. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's guest. So shoot us an email at hello at Upside.FM or find us on Twitter at Upside FM. We'll be back here next week at the same time talking to another founder in our quest to find upside outside of Silicon Valley. If you or someone you know would make a good guest for our show, please email us or find us on Twitter and let us know. And if you love our show, please leave us a review on iTunes. That goes a long way in helping us spread the word and continue to help bring high quality guests to the show. Eric and I decided there were a couple things we wanted to share with you at the end of the podcast. And so here we go. Eric Hornung and Jay Klaus are the founding parties of the Upside Podcast. At the time of this recording, we do not own equity or other financial interest in the companies which appear on this show. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinion and do not reflect the opinions of Duff & Phelps LLC and its affiliates, Unreal Collective LLC and its affiliates, or any entity which employ us. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. We have not considered your specific financial situation nor provided any investment advice on this show. Thanks for listening and we'll talk to you next week. Never mind.